Do you remember what your hands can do? Grab a needle and thread and let's sew together. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah and I run Zone Company. In this class, we are going to put together a hand-sewn face mask out of tightly woven cotton. I've chosen a historically inspired reproduction cotton lined with linen and then linen ties. So the version that I have here is appropriate for wearing, say if you're doing some sort of like historical programming. It's also an excellent gift for somebody and it's also something that you may want to make for yourself just to wear and be proud of. I designed this class so that you can make something functional that you can use, but it also is a fantastic way for you to practice your hand sewing. The theory that I've used to actually put the lining in place is based off of 18th century English gown constructions. So in a way, you're getting some historical hand sewing techniques with this kind of oddly historically appropriate face mask that you can wear today and feel proud of. Let's get started. I want you to remember what your hands can do. So in order to do this, this face mask, I decided to work with silk thread. This is Guterman silk. I'm choosing silk because it's very strong. I'm also choosing a contrasting thread so that it's easy for you to see it as I stitch. It's strong, it's historically accurate, so if you're ever doing historical stitching, this is also a good, good op option. As it relates to needles, I'm using applique needles. These are essentially the equivalent of a size nine. So I would suggest a size nine sharp. And I also like Bowen needles. I like Clover needles. And honestly, you probably have some old needles in a tin somewhere. Um, and embroidery needles are also fine for sewing. You just want a needle that's a little bit longer than say like a quilter's needle, because they tend to be shorter. And nine is gonna give you a fineness, but also it still has a little bit of girth to it. So it's nice and sturdy and durable as you're stitching. Pins. I'm using fine dressmaker's pins. These are one and a quarter inch long. So fine dressmaker's pins, one and a quarter inch long is what you're looking for. Handmade pin cushion. Tiny pair of scissors. Uh, these are from William Whitley and Sons over in England. And they're not, they are an investment, but they're not as expensive as you might think. Um, they're essentially as expensive as going to a local, like Joann's and buying a pair of small embroidery scissors. And they're beautiful, they're sharp, I love them. I'm using small scissors because when you're stitching, you wanna be able to clip threads very easily. If you have a large pair of shears for cutting fabric, such as these, it's a lot harder to snip threads with big scissors as little scissors. Big scissors. These are around eight inches long, dressmaker shears, also from uh, Whitley and, and Sons. Um, Wilkinson Glide is, is what I believe that they're called. And also extremely sharp, nice and lightweight. You definitely want a pair of dressmaker's shears. Again, you can get this at your local Joann's or you can also order them from a specialty shop. Um, the cool thing about William Whitley and Sons, and this is not an ad for them, is that it is a small company who's using you know, traditional Sheffield may making techniques. And so I think that's very cool to support. Some sort of measuring tape. You might be using inches, you might be using centimeters, but you do want to have this kind of on the side to work along with you. Thimble, I love thimbles. I'm right-handed, I wear it on my middle finger of my dominant hand. If you're left-handed, you're gonna wear it on the middle finger of your non, uh, on your on your left hand. A note about thimbles is that you want them to be tight enough that they don't fall off, but not so tight that's uncomfortable. So you want to be able to do this without them falling off. So there's a little bit of a tackiness when I put this on, but it's not so tight that it's hard and it's not so loose that it flies off. Thimbles are not one size fits most. You're going to have to find one that fits you. This is a silver thimble from Colonial Williamsburg. I did give you a suggestion as well from a French uh, gold-plated thimble maker in, in uh, Paris in the materials and supplies list. People like using leather thimbles. You can make your own thimble out of a cereal box, or you might have one in that old tin that maybe was perhaps your grandmother's, or maybe 
uh, you have an old tailor's thimble from a tailor in your family. So wherever you can find them, I do recommend using them. They do feel a little bit weird when you're first putting them on. They feel like this odd amoeba on, your, on the tip of your finger. However, the more you wear it, the less you're gonna start to feel it and the more useful it'll be. So if it, if it is uncomfortable, I would recommend wearing it around your house, maybe for a week or so, to just kind of get used to having it on your, on your finger. The last thing I wanted to mention about tools, it's not really a tool, but it's a supply, would be the pattern that I included in the PDF. Go ahead and cut this out along the non-dashed line. So the solid line, cut it out along the solid line and set that aside because we're gonna be using this to cut out our fabric. A note about fabric, I am using a tightly woven quilter's cotton and this is just a little scrap of it. So you want the tight weave because that's going to help to avoid particles kind of getting pushed out into the world. Um, two layers of quilting cotton is what's generally recommended for non-medical grade masks. And because I have been exposed to 18th century clothing for so long and I've used a lot of linen and I know it's wicking properties and it's comfort properties, I've added for this mask another layer of linen. And so the instructions call for two layers of quilted cotton and then a layer of linen lining. A note about this, that's a lot of fabric. Two layers of cotton and a layer of, line, of, of linen lining is quite bulky. And if you are at any way at risk for getting sore hands or sore arms or anything like that, I would really encourage you to not use the three layers, instead use two layers of cotton. And where I talk about using the white linen, just use cotton instead. So what I'm saying is that for some of you who, you know, you might feel comfortable using two layers of cotton, the linen lining, or some of you may decide that you just want to use an outer layer of cotton and then use the cotton as the lining where I discuss using the linen. If you decide to use it as the lining, I would recommend using the wrong side, touching your face, just so that as you're stitching, you can have a sense of this is, this is the inside and this is the outside. But I didn't want to kind of go forward without mentioning that you do have choices when it comes to this. I'm making this mask in the way that I enjoy wearing it because I love the fact that the linen wicks away the moisture and it, I feel like it actually keeps my face a little bit cooler and more comfortable, but it does add, again, another layer of bulk. So it's completely up to you what you decide you want to do. When I'm sewing, I'm keeping my back nice and straight and I'm using my lap as a table. You might notice that as I pull that needle up, I'm not using my wrist, but I'm actually using my whole arm. In this video, we're going to talk about how I like to hold my hands and proper sewing technique. All right, let's practice some basic sewing techniques. I'm just going to do a running stitch to show you how I like to hold my hands, how I like to hold the needle, how I like to hold my thimble. When I hand sew, it's coming from a place of clothing construction. My whole goal is to sew efficiently with the notion that I probably am making a whole garment. So when I hold a needle, I pinch it with my thumb and my forefinger, and I take the middle finger of my dominant hand and I cur curl it inward. And so what that's going to do is it's gonna position this middle finger perfectly so that it's actually going to be sitting at the back of that needle prime to then help push that needle through. But I'm also gonna be using my left hand. Essentially, the left hand is going to be prepping the material, shaping the material, and then the right hand is going to be wielding the needle. So these are kind of, they're, they're a team. They're, they're working together in order to, to sew. I also wanna make a note as it relates to, to how I hold the fabric. Right now I'm sitting at a table and you likely will be sitting at a table when you're doing your work as well. And in order to create the proper tension for the fabric, I'm actually going to be, I have my, my wrists and my arms on the table. And I'm gonna be pu pushing down just ever so slightly to kind of press into the, into the table. I'm not gonna be curling my body in, I'm still gonna keep my back straight, but I am going to use the table, a little bit of tension there so that I can then hold the fabric 
and stabilize the fabric on my hands, which is which are then stabilized by the table. All of that is going to want to keep the, the needle relatively pa parallel to our bodies. The only exception to that is that we, we are going to be doing a, a spaced back stitch, but we're going to stab stitch because going through all the layers requires you to stab stitch and then you would stitch with the needle perpendicular to your body. So to baste, which is just a big running stitch, to hold this fabric temporarily up, folded, I'm going to dip the needle down to the fabric and then I'm going to use my left hand to gently push this fabric down and my right hand is going to rock. So at the same time, my hands are kind of pushing towards the table. I'm kind of rocking in this motion and so that needle can go through. I'm going to push it with my middle finger. I'm going to pinch it with my thumb and forefinger, pulling this out, pulling, 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 and then I'm going to use my pinky and I'm going to push the pinky away from my body. And once that pinky kind of connects with the thread and then it connects with the fabric, there'll be a slight resistance there. And then you'll know that the tension is correct. The shape of my hand as I'm stitching is going to be in kind of an infinity or kind of a figure eight symbol. And I'm going to be taking my hand and I'm going to be going away from my body. I'm not going to be going this direction. I'm not going to try and like push my body away. I'm just going to be keeping my back straight and just gently moving my hand essentially in, in somewhat of this motion. So again, I'm going to dip that needle into the fabric, kind of rock it back up again, pushing it with my middle finger and then catching it with my pinky. So let me do a couple more stitches so you can just see how I'm not moving my wrist. This is a whole arm motion. And I'm using my left hand also again to stabilize the fabric. So I'm pinching this fabric with my left hand. My hand is stabilized by the table and then the fabric is being stabilized by my fingers. Sometimes this loops up and that's fine. My goal in this video is just to show you my sewing technique. It's not necessarily to teach you one specific stitch, but really just to reinforce that the needle does not have to move in any kind of really um, remarkable way and keeping it parallel to your body, keeping your hands relaxed and getting into a nice motion where you're not actually uh, moving your wrist in any kind of uh, very aggressive way is going to keep your hands nice and comfortable. Now I'm going to put this aside and very quickly show you how I like to stretch my hands. So if you start to feel any kind of tension here or here, what I like to do is press, put my elbow on the table and then press my fingers away from me. And then that's going to stretch, that's going to stretch my hands um, and kind of shaking them out. Sometimes I even use ice to, to um, ice my wrist if I've been sewing particularly long. The face mask runs along the straight of grain of the fabric and the straight of grain is parallel to the selvage so this direction is the straight of grain this direction is the cross grain so i'm going to place my pattern so that it's on the straight of grain and i can line this edge up here parallel to that selvage i'm not going to actually cut into the selvage because it is a little bit more dense but i want to scoot up my pattern pretty much to the point of where that selvage is going to begin and you can look really closely at the grain line of the fabric and there's actually, you can see the, the yarn of the material and you wanna make sure that the edges are gonna be nice and, and lined up there. You can either then put something heavy on top of this and cut it out, or if you are new or if you like using pins, I would suggest actually practicing your pinning because pinning can be kind of an interesting, it can be difficult sometimes when it comes to dexterity. So what I'm going to do is pin this at all four corners. So I'm going to pin it so that the tip of the pin is going towards the point of that pattern. I'm going to push it down into the paper, into the fabric, and then I'm going to rock it back and push it forward. And I'm going to repeat that on all four, on all four sides. This is going to anchor the corners nicely and make sure that it's not going to wiggle around on you while it's... When you cut, you want to make sure your shears are on the table and then press down. So you're squeezing with the scissors. You're not actually holding them up. Instead, you're always leaving them on the table and then pressing down. That's gonna give you a clean cut and it's also going to kind of save your hands from any pain. And voila, 
there's our first piece. For the next two pieces, for the inner portion of the cotton and then for the linen lining, what I would recommend is just use the first piece of fabric that you cut out and then use that as your pattern. So you'll just cut the first one out and then you can replicate it and use it over and over again so that you know that all of the pieces are going to line up nicely. But you still wanna pay attention to the grain line, make sure everything is, is nice and matched up. So you can see here how I used the cotton as a pattern and then just laid it over the linen and pinned it again at the corners. I'm just going to cut that to the right shape. So now I've got my three different pieces. I've got my outer piece, my inner lining piece, and then my lining piece. So let's move on to attaching all three. We've got all three materials cut out. This is going to be the front of our face mask. This is going to be our inner lining, and then this is going to be our lining. So for the time being, I'm going to set my lining aside, and I'm going to turn my outer fabric so that it's face down because this is the portion that will face towards your face itself. And then I'm going to take the floral piece and do the right side to the wrong side. So the right side is the more vibrant side, what's intended as the outside, and the more um, paler side is the, the wrong side. Since this is the inner lining, it doesn't really matter, but what does matter is making sure the grain lines, again, are matching up so that the fabric is going to then be used and kind of work in the same manner because if it was skewed the fabric won't work together i'll probably pin it at the corners kind of like we did with the with the pattern and the reason i'm doing this is because i'm actually eventually going to base this together but by just making sure that the fabric is laying together this will help me with the basting okay so now we're essentially working with one piece of fabric okay now it's time to actually get sewing now that we've pinned our front and our inner lining together, that means that we can now use it as one piece of fabric. The end goal is to actually fold up this raw edge so it has a finished edge like this one, and then actually fold the lining back and then st stitch that into place. So in this series of videos, that's what we're gonna do. We're going to fold up this raw edge, baste it back, and then we're gonna set the lining in so that we can get a nice finished edge so we can then move on to pleating the sides and start shaping that mask. So to baste, I'm actually gonna be using my right and left hands. Now I am right-handed, and so I'm gonna be sewing from right to left. If you're left-handed, you're gonna be stitching and starting from the left side and moving towards the right side. I'm going to finger press up with the combination of my left and my right hands collectively, and just kind of gently folding the fabric a quarter of an inch up, or about, maybe about a centimeter, and then pressing that down with my hands and you can see here how it's not completely on on the line so you may want to trim that uh, if that's your case if that's the case with you um, we, want, we want this edge to be relatively consistent and the same but once we have finger pressed then we can go back with our needle as we talked about in the techniques section of this workshop is we want to keep this needle parallel to our work parallel to our bodies and we don't want to just sew with our wrists we're sewing with our whole hands so to start basting, I'm just gonna dip my needle into the fabric all the way through, and then I'm gonna pop that tip of the needle back up again. I'm gonna push it through using my middle finger, my dominant hand with my thimble, pushing that needle all the way through, pinching it with my thumb and forefinger, pulling this up, and I've knotted it, so it's just gonna lock in place. And I'm just gonna continue down, down the length of this, doing the same exact technique. We're not stab stitching. Again, just dipping the, the tip of the uh, needle into the fabric and then rocking this needle actually back, pushing it through, and then following up with that middle finger to make sure the needle goes all the way through, pinching it with my thumb and forefinger, picking it up again, and then I'm gonna grab actually the thread with my pinky and pull that up. And so I'm just gonna carry on all the way to the other side. 
It's all based along with you. You just wanna make sure that you're getting both layers of fabric. So if you do feel like there's too much under fabric, like here, you might wanna trim it. But regardless, you just wanna make sure that you're basting all the layers together. They don't have to be pretty. They just have to hold. You can see these are pretty nasty big stitches. When I get to the corner, I'm going to fold it at a right angle. I'm not gonna miter the corner. I'm just gonna fold this like so. And then for basting purposes, you can actually go over top. And in this case, I am gonna do a stab stitch. I'm gonna go over top of that fold, pull this through, and that's gonna lock it into place. Then I'm going to progress from the underside to the left, stabbing that needle upwards where I'm gonna start again, pulling it through. And then I'm gonna to continue to baste in the same manner that I did before, by dipping that needle into the fabric, rocking it back and pushing it through. You can see here how it kind of, it got on the, the corner. That happens, happens to me all the time. The motion is very simple. And again, we're using our whole arm for sewing. We're not just using our wrists, we're keeping our hands nice and relaxed because there's no need to be stressed out. Just relax and just practice consistently folding this up and consistently rocking our needle down, popping it back up, pushing it with our middle finger of our dominant hand, picking it up again and pulling it through. Another note about my left hand is that as I dip this needle down into the material and then I rock it back up again, this finger is actually gently kind of catching the needle a little bit. And this is actually pushing the fabric down onto the needle. So both hands are working together. So if you need to pause the video, go back, or you can just kind of watch it over and over again as I am working on this, feel free to. So you can kind of really practice your own, your own technique. Now, I don't have enough thread, so I'm gonna to have to, to pause and then start up again. But when I stop this, I should note that when I'm done with my basting, I actually go back to the stitch I just did, drop the needle in, and then I progress forward on the opposite side of that tail which is actually just a very large back stitch. And what that's gonna do is lock that into place so I don't have to worry about knotting it. So just finish up basting all four sides together and then we will have what should be a nice, almost square basted. And then at the end there, again, I just do that back stitch to lock that into place so that corner should be relatively square. The next step is to grab our linen lining and I can unpin this. So take your pins out so that they're not in the mask when you're using it because that would be uncomfortable. So you can see here how we've got that mask nice and basted together and for me the vine going upwards that means that this is the top of the mask and this is the bottom of the mask. If you don't have a pattern on your fabric, you might wanna mark it or pay attention to where is your bottom and where is your top and where are your sides. So for me, I know that the vine goes up, so this is my top and this is my bottom. And that's gonna be helpful as it relates to uh, pinning my lining in place. Congratulations, you've done your first bit of sewing by basting all of this back. So now our raw edges are completely folded over. So now it's time to set the lining into the face mask. The best way I, I like to do this, because it is just like a square, well, it's a rectangle, is place the linen lining down, flip your face mask over so the right side is facing you, and then just set it onto the lining. And you want to have essentially like a perfect amount of seam allowance coming out from both, all the sides. So you've got quarter inch or about a centimeter around all around it. And then I'm gonna put a pin in the center just to anchor this in place. You know what, actually, I'm gonna pin, put a pin on all four sides like we did before. And then I can flip this over. And then the goal is to take this and finger press this back so that this lining is slightly offset from the folded edge. So in essence, what you're looking at is two folded edges kissing with the lining slightly shorter than that fold. And for this, I am going to pin it into place. 
I know I was talking all about like basting this edge and not pinning it, but this is why we're not pinning it is because we're actually going to be encasing this. And if this was already, if this was pinned, it would make it quite frustrating. Now, as you're folding this lining back, you wanna make sure that you're consistently bringing the same seam allowance to the interior as you were before. Because if you fold too much in, say like if I were to fold like this much in, then that raw edge is gonna be exposed and you're not gonna have enough fabric down here. So it's important that you are consistent in how you fold this back and finger press it. But you wanna make sure that on the outside, you're just seeing the cotton. So go ahead and do this pinning all the way around. So I've gotten it so that I've pinned it on all three sides and now I've got the fourth side to finish. So I thought I would do that with you. I wanted to note that it's very important that this lining is consistently the same dimension, except slightly, of course, inward on the edges as the outer fabric. If this is too short, it's going to actually cause this to kind of buckle in. And if it's too loose, then you're gonna end up with a baggy lining. So as you're working on it, you want to make sure that this, the grain lines of the linen and the grain lines of the outer fabric are the same. And that's why I pinned it into place, but you just wanna gently make sure that it's all laying nice and consistently together. So for this final side, that's what I'm just gonna pay attention to is making sure that it's not bagged out that this is nice and smooth and it's essentially the same dimension. Linen is a little bit more stretchy than cotton is, so you just have to pay attention. At the corners here, I'm just going to fold these back. And then when I pin it, I'm, I like to pin it at the angle and make sure that there's no raw edges popping out. So it's kind of a, a delicate dance of taking a pin and, and pushing that in and then pinning that into place. So that raw edge is pretty much encased. You can see a little bit of the fuzziness right there. That's going to be, I'm actually gonna stitch the lining over top of it. So that should be, that should disappear. But the corners can be a little bit tricky. So you just wanna make sure that you're keeping those raw edges encased and you can use your pin to in essence, sculpt that fabric towards in the direction that you want it to go. So I'm not mitering these corners. I'm just setting the fabric on top of one another. And then this is the last one. It's kind of like folding an envelope, really. So there I've had it. And then the other side, I've got my pin, so I just want to take those out. And now we're ready to get felling. Okay, so now we're going to get started stitching our linings to our outer fabric. If we take a look at the finish mask again, you can really see what I'm referring to. You can see these little tiny angled stitches that are attaching your lining all the way through to the outer portion right there. So this is called a felling. This is called felling. And we use a stitch that's akin to hemming or akin to applique. It's essentially the, the same thing. So to begin, let's start just to the left of the point if or the corner if we're right-handed. And if we're left-handed, we're gonna start just to the right of the corner. We don't wanna start in the corner. That can be a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna start just, again, just a little bit to the, to the left of it. So to begin, I wanna make sure that I've got a knot in my thread and then I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna put it perpendicular through just the linen because this is going to then pull that knot and then hide it. So we're gonna drop that down. And when I went through the, the the uh, linen, you can see I actually only went through about, like it's about two yarns from the top of that fold. So we're not going deep into the material, it's just there on the edge. Now this stitch is not gonna be hidden, it is gonna be visible. And I'm using the technique that I've seen on 18th century English women's gowns. And this is the technique that they use to actually set linings into place. So today there's like a fashion for hemming and for felling to be a little bit more invisible, but this technique was a little bit more seen. And so therefore there's gonna be a bit of a top stitch. So to, in order to attach the linen to the outer fabric, we're going to take our needle and we're going to put it in just to the outer fabric, ever so slightly to the left visually of where this tail is. So I put my needle into the whole fabric, again, just to the left, I'm gonna 
push that through, and then I'm going to push my needle down to it towards the table, kind of rocking this, rocking this up, and then I'm going to connect with that lining. Again, only going through about two threads from the top of that fold, pushing this through, and I'm going to make sure this loop doesn't ca catch on this massive pin that's hanging out here, um, if I can, because sometimes that can be annoying. Okay, so here we go. So I pushed, pulled that through, and now I've made my first stitch. So I'm gonna make my second stitch doing the same technique. Again, progressing ever so slightly to the left of where this tail is into the outer fabric, kind of pushing that needle down and then rocking it back so that it connects to the lining, pushing it through and pulling it tight enough so that these fabrics are starting to connect. If I turn it to the other side, you can actually see that these stitches are visible. I want each stitch to be about, I would say about an eighth of an inch apart, about three millimeters. So they're gonna be relatively close together. So again, I'm dipping my, I'm progressing to the left, or if we're left-handed, we're progressing to the right, dipping that needle into the fabric, and I can feel that actually with my, my middle finger of my, uh, of my left hand. And then I'm gonna rock this back towards the linen, pushing it, of course, the needle through with my middle finger, with my, my thimble, pinching it, pulling it like we did before, and pulling that into place. And then we're just gonna to continue to progress along. You just wanna make sure that you're not taking too big of a bite at the beginning. Sometimes people want to really overcompensate and like put their, their needle down to the fabric aggressively and kind of wrench it back um, using their wrist but we're not using our wrist, we're using our whole arm. And just like with basting, that needle is gonna stay relatively parallel to the work and relatively parallel to our bodies. And what's gonna give it that little bit of an angle is just that progression either to the left of that thread or to the right if you're left-handed. You just wanna make sure you're going through all the same layers and you wanna make sure that you're catching enough of that linen so that the stitch is actually visible. And as you come upon a, a pin, just pull that out. So the goal is just to work at consistency, making sure they're consistently the same distance apart and making sure that you're putting the fabric, putting that needle into the fabric kind of in the same location so that they're the same size. So I'm, you can see here how I'm not doing the best of job there. That's a little bit bigger, that's a little bit smaller. But our goal is that each of these stitches are coming through the lining, catching the same amount of lining each time. And then on the underside, my stitches are slightly at an angle because that's, that's how I put them through the fabric. Some people's stitches might be straighter, but you do want to make sure that it's going all the way through because that's the point is we are now attaching our linen lining to our outer fabric. And once you get a rhythm, just go all the way around and set this lining in. I'm gonna keep sewing with you until we get to this corner because the corner is gonna be uh, a little bit of a challenge to get around. Not impossible, but definitely something that we need to kind of pay more attention to. Also something that I wanna just kind of remind you of is making sure that this linen is ever so slightly lower than our outer fabric. We also want to make sure that the grain line of our linen is still perpendicular to this edge. We don't want to be pushing this too far to the right or to the left that this the grain line is askew. So again, we want all of this fabric to, in essence, be moving in the same direction, and that's going to impact how it, how it wears. So as we're sewing, we just want to be very careful in how we're holding the material. Remember to keep yourself relaxed. Don't get too tense. Keep your hands nice and relaxed. Do not, do not sew like this. Do not sew with your wrists. Make sure that you're sewing with your whole arm. I don't want you to get tired or fatigued. If you are getting tired or fatigued, definitely take a break and stretch your hands. Make sure that you're sitting up straight and tall so that you're not hurting your shoulders. It may not seem like it, but sewing is a whole upper body activity. 
And if you slouch, then you're gonna hurt your shoulders, you're gonna hurt your wrist, and the whole thing will just suffer. So here we are at our corner. And now that I've put my needle kind of right at the corner, I'm gonna take this pin out. And I'm gonna progress around the corner. And you can see here how there's a lot of fabric there. So we wanna make sure that the, the lining itself is actually covering this fold. So sometimes I'll take my pin and I'll, I'll grab just the seam allowance of the outer fabric and I'll push it down a little bit and then I'll squeeze these together. And then I will go, go forward and start sewing. Sometimes I can go all the way through like this and get it. Sometimes the fabric is a little bit too thick and I do have to resort to stab stitching. So that means that I push my needle through all the way and then I come back, essentially mimicking the same uh, shape of a felling stitch, but doing it in a stab stitching method instead. But you can see here how I want to, I've got a bit of thickness there. So I'm going to take my needle and push it through the outer fabric and then go back through the lining. And what this is gonna do is help, if I kind of pull on that a little bit tighter, that's gonna start to help to sandwich all of that together. You can see here the linen lining wants to kind of sneak out. So let's take our, our needle and again, push it away from us, push it down into the material, and then we can progress. This is a little bit thicker. It's a little bit harder to get through. Um, you may have to pull the thread a little bit taut, not super tight, like don't, don't get aggressive with it, but just a little bit snugger. And you might have to take some smaller stitches around the corner just so that everything can, can line up. So there we've got now we've gone around our corner. Now go ahead and just progress to, to the other side and I'll see you there. I hope that the felling is starting to feel more fluid and you're more comfortable with it. I am at my last little bit here. So I've got, to, I have to go around my last corner and then just finish this up. Thought I would do the corner once again with you to kind of show you, cause there is a lot of bulk here. So again, we, I wanna make either smaller stitches and sometimes I even wanna stab stitch all the way through the material, just because that way I can make sure that it is going to be nice and secure. And when I stab stitch and come to the other side, I'm doing a tiny little stitch on the other side, on the right side, that mimics what we would see, that little top stitch that we would see. So we're in essence doing the same type of motion, but we're, or type of stitch, but we're stab stitching just to make sure we're getting all the way through the fabric. because so we just wanna make sure it's anchored in place and, and doing the stab stitch is going to allow you to have a little bit more control, but also it won't be as hard to do. But just be very careful. So when I stab stitch, I'm just going perpendicular through the fabric and just doing tiny little stitches on the other side. So if I've got my tail here, I'm gonna just gonna progress just like a yarn or two to the side and then come up where that hem stitch would come up. So now I'm around the corner, I'm gonna take that pin out and you can see here how I've anchored that corner into place while at the same time hiding that seam allowance here. So now I can just continue on as I've, as I've done. Now, as, as I've kind of made note of before, if you're doing the three layers, it can be quite thick. Uh, and so sometimes stab stitching can be helpful for thick fabrics. All right, we're almost to the end. And I'm just gonna stitch over what I just did. And now for my final stitch to lock this in place, I'm going to go through the outer fabric, kind of catch a little bit of the outer fabric as if I was making a stitch, but instead of coming through the linen, I'm going to pop my needle back up again on the fashion fabric, push it through, make a loop. I'm not gonna finish the stitch yet though. I'm gonna put my needle through, through this loop. I'm gonna go through twice because it's relatively fine thread. I'm gonna pull this so that the knot anchors itself down essentially where the lining and that fashion fabric are meeting. And then I'm gonna take my needle and I'm actually going to put my needle in between the layers. 
and I'm going to push it towards myself, pull that tail down, and that's going to then ostensibly hide that knot. So it should look as if it's a completely seamless project and you don't actually see the knot. And then when I cut this, I actually pull this thread just a little bit. I clip it as close to the fabric as possible and that tension will then make the fabric, or excuse me, make the thread spring back into the fabric so that it doesn't, it doesn't show. So you can see here how you can't tell where that knot is. So congratulations on finish. Congratulations on finishing your body of your face mask. I know that it probably was a little bit hard to go through all the layers if you did three layers. So make sure you stretch, take a rest, all of those things. Something else you can do is you can take out these basting stitches because those are no longer needed. So you can just clip those out. And I'll see you in the next video for attaching the nose piece to the top. Our next step is going to be putting the nose piece on top of our face mask so that it can crimp over our nose and seal it to our face. I'm going to use the strip of fabric that I cut out with my pattern. Earlier in the video, you might have remembered that I actually nudged up my pattern just to the edge of the selvage. And so this way I can actually, if I use this strip, I can use the finished edge of the selvage, this is already a finished edge, and just fold this raw edge back and fold this raw edge back for the casing. I would recommend using Eliza West's pre-done wires. She has these in her Etsy shop and I put them in our materials and supplies list. And so I'm gonna use this as a guide as it relates to the dimensions. And even if you're not using these, I think this is still a pretty good dimension to go off of. And so this is about three and a half inches. So it's about nine centimeters. So to cut this out, I'm going to measure three and then add quarter, add another quarter. Now we're going to baste along those three sides. So fold back the fabric about a quarter of an inch and then do a basting stitch. This is going to hold your casing raw edges back enough so that you can then pin it onto the front of the nose and then fell them into place. So what I'm doing right here is just trying to lock that corner in place. So I'm just kind of basting over the corner and then going around the whole rectangle. And then again, at the corners, just fold that to a right angle, jump over the seam allowance with your thread, put your needle into the material, lock it down, and then put your needle back and then forward to lock that into place. Now your piece is ready to attach to the front. We wanna find the middle, so we fold it in half. This is going to indicate where the top middle is over the bridge of the nose. I would pin it, open it up, pin it into place, and then do the same thing with the casing. Fold it in half, find the center, and then pin that. This way you have two center marks that you now can attach to one another. So place that casing just a hair below the edge of your face mask and line it up with that other pin. That way you know it's perfectly centered. Now go ahead and pin the casing into place. I would recommend pinning it in the middle and then also pinning it on the sides of those corners because the corners are a little bit thick and so this is going to anchor it down nicely.
use a hem stitch or a felling stitch, just like we did with putting the lining in, to attach your nose piece. So here I am just hiding the knot underneath that nose piece. And I'm actually going to start a little bit to the left of the beginning of the nose piece and go backwards and then stitch over top of it because that's a section that might have a little bit of stress as we're putting our new nose pieces in and taking the, the wires out. So I'm reinforcing it there at the corner. And now I'm going forward again. Now I'm going to, to the left. If you're left-handed, you're gonna start a little bit to the right and then go back to the left and then go to the right. If you're right-handed, you're gonna start a little bit to the left and then go to the right and come back to the left and just progress along, filling it into place. It doesn't have to go through all the layers. It can just catch the first couple of layers of the face mask. The whole point is to just keep this in place. And again, it's the exact same technique as we were using before. So just go around the top and the bottom. Of course, don't do the sides, because if you do the sides, you're gonna close up your casing. And the whole point is to create this, this space so that you can then put your wire through. And then knot it off at the bottom, take your little stitch, and make a loop, put your needle through it a couple of times, pull that knot down, put your needle in between the fabric, push it through, hide that knot, clip it, and there you have it. Now take out your basting stitches because you don't need those anymore. So you can take the, the tip of your little scissors and start to pull them out so that they can kind of clean up the front of that mask. And there you have it, a nose piece ready to have a wire put into it. Now let's move on to the next step, pleating the sides of the face mask. Now we're going to move on to the pleating of the sides of the face mask. What makes this mask actually fit around your face in a really comfortable way that covers your face is the simple pleating that you have on both sides here and here. So you can see how that actually allows it to kind of open up and curve around the face. So let's grab our mask and our pattern and we're going to use the pattern as a guide for pleating. I'm not going to worry about measuring. All I'm going to do is actually put this over top of the pattern that I have because this way I can use that as a guide to essentially mark my pleats. When we look at this pattern, these arrows are indicating that this portion here, where that line is, has to just be folded and kiss this line. This line kisses this line and this line kisses this line and subsequently on both sides here. And so all we have to do is know where this point is and where this point is and just make them make them meet. So to do that, I'm going to put my mask on top of my pattern and actually put, pull it down just a little bit so that I can see those lines. And I'm just gonna mark it with pins. So I'm gonna pin it there. I'm gonna pin it here. Essentially anywhere there is that bigger dashed line I'm going to pin it. You can pin it, you can do your favorite marking system. You know, you might like using a washable pen. Uh, you might like using um, like a pencil, but however you wanna mark it, go ahead and do that, just so that you know where that, those lines need to be. And now we're gonna make a kiss. I like to make it so that the folding is going away from me. So essentially this line is perpendicular to my belly button and to my body. And I will take a pinch, making sure that that portion of the pin is essentially at the apex of the pinch. And then I'm just gonna fold it and press that to, to that other pin. I'm gonna take this pin out and well, pin the mask in place. And I can do the same thing on the other side. 
we want to be mindful of how this grain line hopefully is roughly the same grain line across the way. So in essence, you're just kind of pinching the fabric on both sides in an even manner and flattening it down and then pinning this into place. And if it's like slightly off, you can always, you can always um, make it, make it match. All right, so now I'm going to go down once again to the little one and we're going to make these kiss and pin this in place. I think I actually took out my, my pin over here, but that's okay. I can kind of follow the fabric and figure out where that, where that's going to be. The one in the middle, the pleat, the pleat in the middle is slightly smaller than the other two pleats. So you might feel as though you're not taking up as much fabric. Um, and actually I would recommend pinning it from the inside out, just like I did. So put the pin in and then push it to the outside. The bottom is wider than the top. And that's how it's done on the surgical masks that this pattern was based off of. But again, you're just pinching that fabric and attaching it to the next piece. So you're, you're just kind of taking one point and making it, make it match. Sometimes it's a little fiddly and you're just going to have to play with it, but you know, this pattern should be a pretty good guide. And so you can see here how it's been pleated down. So if I gently open it up, you can start to see how it's starting to actually take on a form of its own. So the next step is going to be stitching these pleats down. And we're going to do a back stitch along the edge and then about a quarter of an inch or maybe about a half a centimeter in just so that they're nice and secure. So that's gonna be our, our next step. To attach these pleats together, I'm going to use a spaced back stitch because it's quite strong, but it's also a little bit flexible. And just to warn you, we're going to be stitching through a heck ton of fabric. So this is a time when we likely are gonna be doing some stab stitching because that right there is a big, big chunk. Um, and, and so just to kind of warn you that, you know, some sort of protection on your hand is gonna be a good idea for this section. So to do a back stitch, a space back stitch, I'm going to put my needle kind of right at the end of this pleat. You see how this fold right there, that's the end of it. So I'm gonna start right along the edge in the fashion fabric. I'm actually not even in the lining. I'm gonna pull this up and it's a back stitch. And so that means that I'm actually going to go a little bit to the right. If you're left-handed, you're gonna go a little bit to the left, just, just a yarn or two to the right. And then I'm gonna put my needle down, make sure it's straight. You want it to match up with the thread there. And I'm gonna progress from right to left. So I'm gonna carry on going, doing the same thing, stabbing up through all the layers, pulling this up. I'm gonna go back to the right. My needle's gonna go down into the fashion fabric in perpendicular, nice and straight. Going to progress to the left, going up again, pulling this, pulling this up. Threads knotted on some stuff, so we're just gonna have to use our needle to clean that up, okay? Again, go to the right, or if you're left-handed, go to the left. Drop your needle down. And so what that's going to start doing is you can see here how this fabric is starting to meet together, kind of sandwich together. But I'm just going through the fashion fabric right along the edge. And so if we look at the top of it here, you can essentially go along those top stitches as well, because that will that will carry on the visual of that top stitching along the sides. The nice thing about doing it just here on the edge is that it does mimic that and it doesn't create any kind of visual kind of dissidence, I guess. It's con there's continuity. So we're going to do this to the end of this pleat. Another tip when it comes to doing the space back stitch with a stab stitch 
is you know we've been we've been working with our fabric like this and sewing like this for this one we're actually going to kind of hold this so we look at the cross section that way too when you push down you can still use your whole arm you're not going to be you know wrenching yourself so even with this technique make sure that you're still using your whole arm and you're but you're just kind of going back and forth up and up and down back and forth And once you're at the end of the pleat, make one more stitch, pull that pleat down, and then we'll do a knot at the back, grabbing a little bit of a bite out of the fabric, creating this loop, going through it once or twice, and then we can bury that needle in between the layers of the linen and then trim that off. And so now you've got one side that's already stitched on. And do the same thing to this side and then we'll move on to doing the next row of back stitching just to make it super, super secure. All right, let's talk ties. I like to use linen ties because they're natural fibers, but they're also a little grippy. So they don't wanna slide on your head when you tie them on. Like you don't wanna tie them right over your ears because they are a little hard. Um, I like to tie mine around my neck and then over my head, and then that's quite comfortable for me. Um, but if you need a tie that is uh, springy and has a little bit more give, then I would suggest grabbing like an old t-shirt and tying and creating ties out of that. Or if you have extremely sensitive skin, I would also recommend using like a softer knit, like a jersey, again, like an old t-shirt for the ties. Um, but I'm gonna use this half inch or centimeter wide linen tape for my ties. You can use a quarter inch, half inch, either is fine. I like to cut it about 16, well, it's finished at 16. So I'm gonna cut four of these at 17 inches. It's a little bit out of frame, but, so we're gonna measure, measure it to the 17 mark and then we're gonna snip it. So I'm gonna do that here. I'll keep 17 in the frame. All right, so 17, and we're gonna make four of those. And once you have one, then you can just use this one to measure the rest on. So we've got the one, and now we're gonna cut four more of these. We want, again, four, four ties. Now that we've got our ties, we want to finish off this raw edge. And these ties are going to be attached at these four points. And I want to attach them so that they're coming out at an angle like so. We don't wanna attach them like this, because if we do that, then the, the way it sits on our heads are, is gonna be kind of odd. Same with this. So we want to attach these ties bisecting this 90 degree angle, if that makes sense. So if, if we've got our, our corner, 90 degree corner, our ties are going to sit again bisecting it at that 45 degree angle. And I'm going to fold this back about a quarter of an inch just to make that raw edge go away. And then this is going to be attached, and I'm gonna set that into the face mask. I would say from the point to the fold is about a half an inch or about a centimeter, give or take a little bit. And then I'm pinning it at an angle like so. And then I'm going to use a felling stitch just to fell all the way around this and also fell this underneath it as in addition to that. So I'm gonna start from underneath here, just like we did before. I'm going to just put my needle into the thing that's being felled down. So before it was the, the lining, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a tape. And so I'm going to stitch, again, felling this in place, just like we did before. So as you're starting to see, this stitch is a remarkably versatile stitch. It doesn't have to go through all the layers. I would just say like the top, the top two layers is probably fine. And we're just gonna move our way around the tape. but we're perpetually turning this around so that our hands don't have to go in awkward ways. Like we could 
I could move my wrist, but instead I'd prefer not to. I'd prefer to move the work versus move my hands. Because I'm thinking about, again, sustainable hand sewing, something that we can do for a longer period of time. Don't want to injure ourselves. All right, now that I'm at the corner there, I'm going to flip this over. So you can see how this is disconnected still. So we want to fell the face mask now to the tie. You can keep this, you can use the same thread. Coming up from this side, so I'm going to go through this material and come up on the underside, other side. And now I'm just going to attach the face mask to the tape. So we're stitching on the outside and we're stitching on the inside. Now that I'm at this point where I've, I'm done, I'm going to knot it off just like I've done before, taking a little bit of a bite out of the linen, making a loop, going through that once or twice, probably just once in this case, and then I'm gonna bury that needle into the face mask and then cut that off. And you can see how it looks like on the outside. So it kind of follows the edge. Now do that on the other three sides. And then after you're done stitching on all three sides, if you've got linen tape, I would recommend hemming the bottom of this because this is gonna fray. And on these other ones that I've used time and time again, it's starting, starting to fray a little bit, not too bad. Just to really finish it off, I'd recommend hemming the bottom of your tape, but it's not mandatory, you don't have to. But to do this, I'm just gonna finger press this up just a smidge, like an eighth of an inch, and then I'm gonna fold it up again. So I'm just gonna finger press, kind of roll up that fabric, and then I'm going to fill it, just like we've done all along. This stitch is going to be, will come in so much handy for so many things, from hemming, setting linings in, it's used to sew seams. It's remarkably versatile. Hello, congratulations on finishing up your face mask. This is mine. I'm sure yours looks amazing. So we've got our wire that's gonna go into the casing that we made. And so all we have to do is slide that in at the top, like so. So that'll be nice and flexible. And then to put this on is then I'll position this at the top of my nose. I'll put this right at the top here, so it's not touching my ears. Draw this down over my chin, and then I tie it around my neck. And then there's still opening here, so then I can press this so it's nice and fitted. And there you have it. A face mask that covers this direction and this direction, and it's very snug. It also works perfectly for historical reenactment too. Can't wait to see yours.